had a particular impact on women in Afghanistan. One million people were retired. More than one million were injured. But the conflict, the war, didn't end. The conflict today in Afghanistan did not start within Afghanistan. Um, it came from outside. The Afghan conflict over the past four decades has spawned a large war economy on our western border. Pakistan is viewed not positively in Afghanistan. It is viewed as, as a site to the conflict. We would like to get engaged with Pakistan. This was not the narrative that existed 10 years back. What is it going to take to um, find a way toward peace? Peace with the Taliban is possible. Afghanistan and Pakistan have been the victim of wrong politics of our politicians. Good fences make good neighbors. The most peaceful region in the world perhaps is Europe, and there are no fences there between the countries. First, I want to congratulate Fosia for she just started um, uh, the first women-led political party in Afghanistan. Yay, Fosia! It's called the Movement of Change for Afghanistan. Very impressive and very important for Afghanistan. One thing about Fosia, if I could say as well, you know, um, conflict has been been part of Afghanistan for the last 40 years. Um, one of the things that um, women have said in Afghanistan is that women's participation and a somewhat regressive approach to women in Afghanistan is in part cultural and tradition. tradition. But many women in Afghanistan, and Fozia will tell you, is that that's not true. Um, that really came with conflict. And before that, women in Afghanistan were, in fact, very much a part of society. Uh, women in Afghanistan, from whether it was Pashtun women, whether it was Tajik women, <laughs> whether it was Hazara women, um, they, they were very much a part of society. They were um, uh, politicians, they were bus drivers, they were in the police. So conflict has had a particular impact on women in Afghanistan in that it's created a um, it started with the Russian invasion and, and, and that um, use of, of uh, Islam or religion as a fervor to, to um, uh, send people off to battle. And so um, they used that as a way to get uh, the Mujahideen um, inspired to fight the communists. But the biggest price paid by this, paid for this, has been women in Afghanistan. And, uh, and since 2001, Although I have to say, I'm, I, I don't think that they've done a great job on, on women's rights in Afghanistan, unable to even pass the uh, um, elimination of violence against women, which is a bit of a problem. And um, there's still a great deal of injustices um, that women in Afghanistan face. But people like Fauzia Kofi are inspiring. These are the people that will make a difference in the country. and so. On that note, Fuzzy, I'd like you to discuss a little bit, if you would, to talk about what has been the impact of conflict on women. Um, how do you um, demand that women's voices be heard? And are there concessions that women are prepared to make for peace? Or do you think that's just not the route to go? It's such a pleasure to be uh, in Lahore um, for my first time, um, the historic city. Um, of um, culture, poetry, uh, politics, um, with uh, such a inspirational uh, leaders, uh, change makers in Afghanistan, Pakistan. Uh, also, I would like to thank Kathy for her efforts in Afghanistan, Pakistan. I just looked at her hand and I asked what happened. Um, she actually was shot four times in one of the provinces in Afghanistan, but that never disappointed her uh, to give up. So a big round of applause for her. <laughs> yeah, <I guess. laughs> um, before speaking about uh, women's rights uh, and the impact of conflict on women's rights, I think we are living in a world where every aspect of our life is interconnected. Um, more than 50 years back, uh, Martin Luther King um, mentioned the world as a world house. 
a world house where citizens share common values, strive for common goal of a better place for all human beings. Today, we are in the right path after 50 years of that world house. The world has become more divisive. People who speak of hatred and discrimination are the champions. The disengagement for a positive way is a common uh, road. We have become more uh, distant from uh, a place, a world which is a, a common house for everybody. And of course, women are no exception to this world. Women are no exception to, uh, to be affected by conflict, by war, by culture, wrong aspect of culture and tradition, misinterpretation of religion. Women are no exception to discrimination and the world is very unequal still to, uh, to uh, gender, to race, to uh, religion, we are still identified. And our first identity is where we come from, what religion, what color. It is not still the world citizen. Speaking about Afghanistan, let me say that the movement for women's change in Afghanistan did not start by fall of Taliban. We have a long history of civilization and women participation in our political social arena. In fact, Afghanistan and Turkey started at the same time sending their girls to school. If it was not because of conflict and war that is imposed to us, probably we would have been able to do much better, achieve much more indicators than we are now as opposed to Turkey. Because we sent our first group of women to be trained on medical services in 1973 to Turkey. Can you imagine where is Turkey when it comes to their human rights, uh, uh, to their education? I'm not talking about now what's going on in Turkey. It is not a good role model for us anymore. But when it comes to social indicators, look at where is Turkey, Afghanistan. Unfortunately, the, the, the second name for women in Afghanistan is the poor Afghan woman. An identity which I strongly disagree. Yes, women of Afghanistan are poor, people of Afghanistan have been into war, but we are resilient and strong women of Afghanistan. We have been, we have been able to face difficult situations. Can you imagine 40 years of war? We have lost our loved ones. 2019, in fact, was the deadliest year for people of Afghanistan. Civilian casualties at, at speak based on the UN very recent report. Civilian ca casualty being committed by the Taliban insurgency, but by also by the government. And women pay the biggest and the first price in this. They lose their husbands, they lose their sons, they um, have to flee their villages, and above all, they are deprived of social and education opportunity because of war. So if you look at our history and you compare it to now, yes, it was during the civil war and during the Taliban that women of Afghanistan experienced, and you know, being our neighboring country, uh, the, the immediate neighboring country, and the host for uh, millions of Afghans, uh, uh, you know the, our, our situation. So it was the civil war and the Taliban that women of Afghanistan were pushed back. Post-2001, women were able to come back, re-emerge. Um, right now, more than 30 to 40 percent of, of literacy rate, women are illiterated. Um, probably one of the highest in South Asia when it comes to women politicians. We are 25 percent in the parliament. That's thanks to quota. I think you also have a quota. Um, uh, women participate in economic growth. We have our um, ex-finance minister, a very honorable uh, um, uh, character, respected in Afghanistan, who might speak about this. But women contribute to economic growth. 
they are in the first um, line of standing for their future and ready to enter no entry zone. You know, I can see more majority of you are main. Thank you so much for your interest to listen to this topic, but, um, but there are predefined boundaries when it comes for women, predefined boundaries. And we as women seem to accept that. Security is not something that women should talk about. Peace, we agree that no or very little wars in, in the world have started and, and being managed by women. But peace, it is not something for women. Women can, al can always enter later. Major issues, it is not for women to talk about. That scenario is now being changed. Women of Afghanistan are capable, willing to be in the driving seat. And a small example for that is the recent peace process, which is now called off. We are hoping that it will start. Um, but, uh, but women were the major part of it. We did not rely on internationals to decide on our destiny. It was a difficult area to enter, but as I said, we should not go by the boundaries and limits that are set for us, the predefined limits. So women are part of the peace process. We are hoping that, that any change for positive, women of Afghanistan will be part of this, part of their future. Now, it has never been easy. Afghanistan and Pakistan have common history. It has never been easy. But I think the fact that after all what has happened to us, we are able to stand, move forward, look forward, that is very important. And that's something that you can see in the women of Afghanistan. Fazia, just before you, go, uh, before you sit down, can I just ask you, um, one of the things in terms of the peace process, the Taliban have said that they accept women participating, but not as president and not as a Supreme Court Chief Justice. Now, is that a um, restriction that is acceptable for women? Are women prepared to compromise that away for a peace agreement? Well, let me also say that, um, uh, you know, I was part of the peace uh, talks, dialogues, uh, along with uh, uh, Minister Zakhilwal in three rounds of uh, dialogues, I would say, not peace talks, because the talks have not, not officially started. I was part of them and uh, was able to listen to what Taliban views are about women's rights. Um, yes, they uh, seem to have uh, different views uh, from the time that they were ruling. I was living in Afghanistan all my life, including during Taliban. They seem to have changed in some of the uh, very extreme views that they had before about women's to, uh, rights to education, women's rights to work, but still they have their own uh, um, sticks. They, uh, as you rightly said, they, they think women can be prime minister but not head of state. A woman cannot be uh, a judge in, in two areas which probably most of us know what they, uh, they want, uh, or the imam. Um, we have a constitution which um, respects equal rights for all citizens, regarding, regardless of their gender, their race, their religion, um, their ethnicity, their color. Every human being has equal rights before a constitution. Uh, now, I think it's very common in a peace process that every, uh, the two sides try to start from the extreme points of view, from uh, to, to pro pretend that they are superior in their demands. I think that's kind of part of peace process. But that does not mean that people of Afghanistan in general, because Afghanistan right now is a transformed society. That transformation is at the village level, at the province level, at the national level. I don't think generally people of Afghanistan, but in particular people, women of Afghanistan, will be willing to pay more for peace. We have already paid for a lot for war. We don't want to achieve a peace for which women's rights are sacrificed. If it's okay with the panel, um, what I would like to do is I'd like to give each of the individual panelists an opportunity to address the issue of um, uh, peace and um, what it will take to come to peace in Afghanistan. And then I would like to have a conversation more on Pakistan-Afghan relations. Um, it's a very difficult relationship, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, 
uh, quite close, millions of refugees, uh, but a very um, tense relationship in terms of um, uh, Pakistan's involvement in Afghanistan, what kind of involvement. And I think it's a very interesting discussion to have when we have uh, Mr. Ashikzai and we have Mr. Zahwal and we have Mr. Dastagir. I mean, it's a, very, it's a very interesting conversation and I think it's a very important conversation if peace is actually to come to Afghanistan, if two neighbors have so little trust in each other, it's very difficult to um, see how to stabilize the region. And I guess I would like, uh, if I could ask um, uh, Mr. Ajaxai first, if you could please, um, uh, uh, so we're moving a little bit because Fauzi, you covered the women very well and, I, I, and you would cover this very well as, as well and I would like to get your, your opinion on this. But I think because we have this panel, um, it's, very, it's a very interesting subject for me. Um, how do you get a stabilized region when you have such hostility between um, the two countries? And, and, even, and, and even below the surface, there, there's, there's a, such a lack of trust. And uh, so if I could ask first, um, and then we can have a conversation about it, but maybe if I could ask each of the panelists, the, the men, Mr. Achiksai, if you could first, as a Pashtun activist, and, and uh, um, certainly you've been involved in the jurgas that, that have been um, formed by, um, at one point, I think, uh, President Karzai at, at one point. Um, but if you could please discuss um, how do you improve uh, the relationship, what's the key, key problems between uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, and how do you improve that trust between the two countries so that you can have some real stability in this region? Because neither one of you trust the other. So if you could please start and then we'll work. Sorry, I'm, I've changed the, the discussion a little bit because I can. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd first apologize for my very poor English. So if my English words vocabulary ended, I will get up to Urdu. If that ended, <laughs> if that also didn't work, then I'll get up to Pushto, my mother language. <laughs> I'm being here under the pressure of the daughter of Asma Jangir. She was the lady who ordered me to participate in this discussion. I have no preparations. My English is poor, but the topic, I object. Conflict, no, genocide of people. It is not a conflict. It is a genocide of the Afghan people since 40 long years. So in this genocide, I think daily 200 people are being killed. So the first problem is not this one. I'm thankful to my sister. She discussed it in very detail. What Afghans are, my personal opinion, what they are punished for. I will just a little bit deviate from the topic. Before the coming of the civilized nations of Europe after the Industrial Revolution, Afghans were the mini superpower of the region. Pakistan is a country, including both Punjabs, both Kashmirs, and even the suburbs of Delhi, they were the colonies of Afghanistan from Oxus to Indus. This was Afghanistan. The great poet, Shairi Mashrik, Alama Iqbal, in his poetry, Urdu mein farmate hain, ek hun muslim haram ki paasbani ke liye, neel ki sahil se lekar, taab kha ke kashgat. For your convenience, in this couplet, Allah Iqbal says, he gives us the boundaries of Islamic world that all the Muslims are 
ready for the protection of Kaaba. They are from River Nile to the mountain of Kashgar. But practically what happened? Don't mind, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be, I'm just a student of history, I'm just telling you history. From Oxus to Indus, this was Afghanistan. When the civilized nations came here with a due apology, the entire Arab world subjugated, surrendered. The great Indian surrendered. Middle East, Iran, Far East, Indonesia, Malaysia, wherever the kalma was spoken, la ila illa Muhammad Rasulullah, a single inch of land was not there which was not occupied by European forces. The only people who resisted our good English masters were the Afghans. And they did not surrender completely. History, the history of India by its own historian, six volumes, in that they say that the final eight, 60, 70 years of war, actually it was between poor Afghans and British Empire. Unfortunately, the Hindus, the Sikhs, the Muslims, they became not only be surrendered, but became the tools of British Empire to occupy Afghanistan for 17 long years. And then the Dural Line was drawn. I don't go into detail. So Afghans, are they punished for this? That they love their freedom. They love their sovereignty. They love their land to be governed by their own people. So if this is, I, I, I request, I request the civilized nation of the world. This conflict, which is not conflict, I say genocide. When the Soviet forces occupied Afghanistan, December 1978, 79. 79. 79. American and her allies, their stand was that a superpower, and they were correct, a superpower has occupied a very small main nation. It has occupied it has violated dem democracy. It has violated human rights. So we Americans, we are for the Afghan people. And the entire globe, the entire globe, excluding the schemes of Antarctica, excluding the schemes of Antarctica, they came to this conflict. European countries, America, they, I, this is my opinion, that we are not going to sacrifice our own children for the independence of Afghanistan. The Afghans said we have. We have our heads, we have our sons, support us monetary, monetarily and with weapons. And Americans, with their allies, they really supported them with seven or seven, seven or eight billion dollars in cash and money and so, fire, or what you would mean, fire power. The Afghans heroically fought their war. One million people were retired. More than one million were injured. But the conflict, the war, did it end? What is the situation now? What is the situation now? My dear guest and my cheer person should not mind it. The entire world 
from America, all the continents, Africa, America, Asia, to the entire continents and their people are in depth of one people. The war is going on, where did you go? Islam went away. In this war, each and every people, each and every communist China, Buddhist Japan, the entire Muslims, Jews, they are participated. India, India diplomatically, it, it, it was not involved in murdering people or involving her, her army, but she supported Afghanistan. Now, our genocide is going on. It is 20th century, I'm sorry. It's 20th century. Humanity and human beings are gone to that standard that they say, kill wolves in so, in so many numbers. The killing of jackals, the killing of leopards, the killing of very, very dangerous snacks, the killing of monkeys, it is limited. The, ki the, ki the, ki the killing of birds, pheasants, November, December, January, you can shoot a pheasant. No, don't shoot. Are the Afghan people don't have, do the Afghan people don't have the right of pheasants? The right of jackals, the right of enemies, the, the right of uh, 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 dangerous snacks? It will not work. It will not work. Since 40 long years, everything in Afghanistan was done and performed under the auspices of the United Nations. So United Nations, its security council, and the entire world is bound to come and stop this conflict. They have the power. Each and every people, English, English blood, American blood, German blood, the, the blood of every continent is being, what, what do you say? Sure. Yeah. So that who, who are those people? Why did have, they, they have that much insatiable blood trust of Afghan people? That must be pointed out. Whoever they are, they are not that much powerful. They are not that much powerful. The Security Council, all the atomic powers, they can, they have the power to cordon up, cordon up the neighbors of Pakistan, the neighbors of Afghanistan including Pakistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, this and that and that, China. You will not interfere here. And then they must watch who is interfering. They must watch. And they have the power to stop them. We can't do it. What, what the hell can, can do? What did my sister can do? What Karzai can do? What Ghani can do? If there had been a peace, Nobel Peace Prize, for the people who love their motherland. Since the creation of Adam and Eve, this is my opinion, it might be wrong. Since the creation of Adam and Eve, 640 long war of very dangerous weapons has not been fought anywhere. Since 40 long years, mother of our bomb is being used. The only thing remain, remain is the atomic bomb. We want to use that there. If there had been Nobel Peace Prize, I think the Afghans have this right that the entire world should put off their hats and give them the Nobel Prize for <laughs> the love for their country. Mr. Atikzai, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I just have one question for you because we, we want to get to the other panelists as well. That's when you say, you when you say, uh, I just have one question because we want to get to the other panelists as well. When you say Afghan, are you defining it according to geography or how do you define Afghan? You said Oxus to Indus. Are you defining it as Pashtun? Or are you defining Afghan, it as... Uh, Afghans, Afghan, in I, a word. I told, I told you uh, from Oxus to Indus, it was Afghanistan. But are you defining it by One, geography? 
geography no, or, or Pashtuns? No, no, not Pashtuns. No, no, no. Every, every single person, even the, here in the Pashtun area, of, from this one of, of, of the rural line, every person who resides in the Pashtun area, either here or the Afghan state there, whose house in Pashto we call Kor, house Kor, and we call the grave Gore. Whoever person has got Kor and Gore in Afghanistan, whatever language he speaks, whatever creed he has, whatever color he has, he has equal rights like uh, President Ghani, like my father, Abdul Samad Khan like me, like the Khalwa. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, if, if I could, um, Mr. Sakhiwal, now, for those who, who I'm sure everybody does, but Mr. Sakhiwal was a, a former uh, ambassador um, uh, to Pakistan from Afghanistan. Um, he's been in the government in Afghanistan. Um, he's got a deep sense of what is happening with the peace process in Afghanistan, has been a very active in terms of um, trying to discuss from all sides the, the peace process and, 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 and knows the complexities of it. So I would ask if, if, if you could um, speak a little bit. I, I would still like to, to, to bring in the relationship and, and how important is that relationship between Pakistan and Afghanistan to stability in the region and what is it going to take to um, find a way toward peace um, after, after 18 years? Indeed, peace at a time uh, that when both uh, my sister, Fazia Kufi, and also my brother, Mahmoud Khan uh, described the situation in Afghanistan, um, if not their word, but meant sort of an extremely catastrophic and bloody situation. If 200 people die a day, um, there's not only 200 people being killed. There are hundreds more injured. There are 200 mothers plus um, who've lost um, a kid. There are 200 young women who've lost husbands um, and hundreds of sisters and brothers who've lost brothers and loved ones or father or something else. So it's indeed a tragedy. Only yesterday um, in, 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 um, in a village that my mother came from, um, an extremely poor place, um, up in the mountains, um, were far away from politics and far away from everything else. Yes, regular people, farmers and all that. Um, they were performing Friday prayers, a small village, and bomb exploded in that, that mosque. Um, 62 people um, die uh, or killed, and the remaining everybody else is injured. This whole village, Every house has a casualty. Um, um, today, somebody from that area um, um, uh, had written that uh, there was a woman who had lost a father, a husband, and a son. Um, so you can imagine um, going back into those people as to, to, to how this continuous bloodshed in Afghanistan uh, has affected the lives and livelihood of not just, you know, um, uh, city-based people, but ordinary people throughout the country. And the more um, you see this, um, the more that we need to get serious about peace. Um, the more um, these casualties continue, uh, the stronger the resolve should be for peace. Um, whereas, unfortunately, uh, with such incidents, the hope for peace diminishes. We need to keep it alive. Um, just as Fawzia Kufi mentioned, both of us are fortunate uh, to have been involved um, in our efforts for peace, participated um, in significant events, uh, particularly um, this year, uh, whether that was um, um, two times in Moscow, um, sitting with the Taliban leadership uh, to convince them um, to, um, to offer peace and also in, in Qatar um, 
uh, we both were involved not only in the bigger meetings, but in some smaller meetings in which we were negotiating um, joint statements and communiques and uh, sort of um, bringing a written form as to how peace uh, could come to Afghanistan. Um, and then interacting uh, with the opposite side, um, using, um, you know, uh, every possible uh, sort of logic and explanation and facts and figures and, and, and how evil war was uh, for everyone, including for the Taliban and their families. We must not forget that either. Now, the question is how hopeful we should be for peace. Um, now, peace um, in Afghanistan uh, is multidimensional. Um, if only it belonged to Afghanistan or to pe people within Afghanistan, that would have been much more easier. Um, it has regional dimension and it has international dimension. Uh, actually, the conflict today in Afghanistan did not start within Afghanistan. Um, it came from outside. Um, it came with the, in the form of Soviet occupation and then the Western response in the regional response to that occupation. And, you know, Soviet was defeated. Soviet no longer exists. Um, the West still reaping probably the dividends of the end of the Soviet Union, but we continue to pay a price for that. Um, the regions may have or may not have benefited from it, but they unfortunately were involved um, till today. Um, and, and, uh, but we, again, continue to suffer. Um, again, I'll start from the, from the national or, or internal um, dimension of it, um, whether it was sort of the regional countries' interference or the faraway countries' interference. Um, the reality is that today, in Afghanistan, Afghans are fighting Afghans. It's Afghans being killed on both sides. It's animosity within the Afghans that has been created. And there is, again, um, war has led to the birth of new groups, new ideologies, and, and all sorts of behaviors and all that. Taliban were one, Daesh today, you know, totally alien phenomena yet still has found um, some space. Um, and it's that warring sort of environment that provides that opportunity. But at the end, uh, we know uh, that even if uh, the Western countries and the regional countries um, become much more positive, become way more constructive, become supportive of peace, um, it will have to be up to the Afghans to make peace amongst themselves. And for that, the intra-Afghan discussion, dialogue, um, and, and hopefully, eventually, peace negotiations becomes extremely, extremely important. Um, the meetings, particularly this year, um, <coughs> the meetings that were open to media as well, uh, that we have participated in, have encouraged us, uh, have made us a bit more positive that <laughs> peace with the Taliban is possible, that we do see a realization um, within them um, that mistakes um, in the past uh, um, few decades, including theirs, uh, have contributed to a lot of um, destruction of the country. Um, and they, they do not feel as if they have ended up um, benefiting from it either. Um, so therefore, we do see a desire within them for peace, and we as Afghans will have to find that language and that way as to how we do it. But that alone will not be enough. Um, then it's the region. The region will have to become more constructive. Um, in this Pakistan, of course, role is extremely important. Um, um, Pakistan is viewed not positively in Afghanistan. It's viewed as, as a side to the conflict. Um, and that image needs to change. And we do know that in Pakistan, uh, there are perceptions about Afghanistan either. Um, 
Pakistan, the intentions in Afghanistan are suspected that it cannot possibly be good intentions in, in, in Afghanistan likewise. Where the reality, um, again, me being in Pakistan for three years and talking to not just um, leaders and ordinary people in Islamabad, but throughout Pakistan, um, um, with the exception of maybe extremely few, there's nothing but love uh, within Pakistanis for Afghanistan. Um, but we need to translate the love of the public into a good and constructive policy um, that supports peace in this country. Um, and with that, hopefully, uh, if Pakistan leads that sort of uh, regionally supportive uh, policy initiative for peace in Afghanistan, we hope that other countries will also um, come on board and will become more constructive and helpful uh, to peace. And that's extremely, extremely important. And then, as of course, is the West, the U.S. in particular, it has presence in Afghanistan. Um, um, it is now a factor, uh, no doubt, a reason for Taliban to fight, if not the, all the reasons, but at least one of the reasons. Um, it, 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 as Afghans, even though we served um, in the government in the past um, 15, 16 years in different parts, um, I was Minister of Finance, I was... Uh, many different positions and all that. Um, but no country at the end would want any foreign force since presence on, on its soil. Um, so as much as the, the U.S. wants, uh, sorry, the Taliban wants foreign forces um, um, exit from Afghanistan, we want it too. But we want it with peace. Um, we do not want um, uh, the repetition of the Soviet's withdrawal from it. That's also something that we desired, we focused upon, it happened but then it led to bigger disasters. We certainly would not want um, an exit that leads to another cycle of violence. So a responsible exit, but certainly an exit would be helpful to peace, and that's what we support. And that's why in our joint statements with the, with, with the Taliban, I don't know if it was the first or the second or the third article, that we, the Afghans all support the full withdrawal of foreign forces from our country. <laughs> And we are glad that that negotiation has taken place, even though we, it was suspended. Um, I don't believe it is totally sort of um, collapsed. We hope that that will resume. Um, with that resumption, that dimension um, is also helpful. Um, and so that international, the U.S. and the Western countries, um, <laughs> the Allied forces, with regional becoming more supportive, and we, the Afghans, talking to each other, um, um, despite the violence and all that, I'm more optimistic for peace um, than I was a year ago. Um, I'm more optimistic today than I was many months ago. Um, and, and inshallah, hopefully next year, if we do get invited here, that um, we then tell you um, a post-peace settlement um, situation in the country. Thank you. Former Defense Minister, um, very active in terms of uh, Afghan-Pakistan relations. Um, I think you have an insight perhaps that many people uh, don't have that can help, uh, help us and, and, and help the audience understand what it's going to take for um, Afghans and Pakistanis to trust each other. Now, I think that really at the heart, as, as Mr. Zahiwal did say, there is a, a sense in Afghanistan and, and that, that they can't trust Pakistan. They, they do feel that the, the um, um, uh, actions of Pakistan have been more about being sort of the... Um, uh, 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 giving them strategic depth so that somehow feeling that, Pakistan, that Afghanistan was a little bit of their, their, their um, uh, um, sphere of influence. Um, what does Pakistan have to do to, to win over the Afghans, do you think? And, and how did this relationship develop, uh, this, this real lack of trust on, on, on the part of the Afghans and Pakistanis? Uh, Ms. Gannon has... Uh thrown difficult questions at me, uh, but I will try to put up a little bit of context before I answer the questions. Um, Pakistan and Afghanistan have been, of course, neighbors for uh, 
formally for at least 72 years since Pakistan came into being. Uh, but they, we have been now intertwined for four decades. Um, and it's a relationship that is fraught with perils, weariness, and mistrust, as you have rightly said. Um, and it's a strange fact uh, that I don't find any explanation for it, uh, that the presence of millions of Afghans on Pakistani soil for more than four decades also has done little to mitigate that mistrust. Um, and so despite hosting four to six million Afghans in our midst uh, for, for 40 years, um, and I have to confess this, most Pakistanis find it too hard, uh, hard to think about Afghanistan uh, beyond stereotypes. Uh, so for our parents' generation, I remember my father telling us uh, going to Kabul to watch Indian f movies uh, and uh, buy uh, Western products which were not available in Pakistan. Uh, but for our generation, uh, as we grew up uh, in the 80s and onwards, um, our experience of Afghanistan is, is distorted uh, by the triple stereotype of tribalism, uh, terrorism, and territorialism. Uh, and we are still, I think, struggling to go beyond these three stereotypes. Um, but of course, the challenge is on us uh, as Pakistanis, uh, maybe more so as policymakers, uh, to keep in view the full complexity of Afghanistan's ethnicities, linguistic diversity, and how ethnicity and religion also combine in different ways uh, to form distinct groups and patterns of economy. Um, and it seems to me that history uh, divides Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, but geography, certain ethnicities, and trade have united us in different ways. Uh, another of the less remarked upon factor that I uh, think in terms of Pakistan-Afghanistan relationship uh, is that the Afghan conflict over the past four decades has spawned a large war economy on our western border. Uh, and the stakeholders in this very large war economy, uh, which is largely illicit, uh, they are a factor in perpetuation of this conflict. Um, and while I'm going to say a few brief words regarding uh, the rights of women and minorities in Afghanistan, I want to clarify that it implies no assertion of virtue uh, regarding these issues on Pakistani side. We have much to answer for uh, on that account here also. Uh, so there is, uh, I, I imply no, no virtue here. Uh, but I think it's this issue um, of this historical determination of the religious and tribal leadership in Afghanistan uh, to ensure the seclusion of women, that's a f historical fact, uh, and to resist attempts to increase their exposure uh, to the outside world through education, employment, and healthcare. Uh, but as one report uh, has noted, uh, that at the same time, the Taliban in their rule uh, in the late 90s um, imposed very draconian restrictions on women uh, the experience of exile has also led to a greater openness to female education uh, and employment among the rural population. Uh, so my first uh, request to all Pakistanis is to study our neighbor Afghanistan in more depth. Uh, and also uh, look the past secure squarely in the face um, and reckon with it. Because until we face that past, particularly the past 40 years and its realities, uh, we will not be able to go forward. So, so step one, if it's a stepwise relationship in uh, curing the mistrust, is for us Pakistanis to face the reality uh, of the past 40 years uh, of our relationship. Uh, first, of course, uh, how the role Pakistan played during the occupation of Afghanistan by the Soviet Union, uh, and then, of course, you might also call it the occupation of Afghanistan by the United States and NATO uh, since 2001. Uh, and the role Pakistan played in it uh, is one of the reasons, uh, maybe not the only reason, uh, that uh, Pakistanis are viewed by uh, mistrust by most Afghans, as Mr. Zakhilwal uh, said. 
We also have to look at the granularities of Afghanistan and to see that, yes, the Pashtuns might be relatively homogenous, uh, but the non-Pashtun population of Afghanistan uh, has uh, these ethnicities uh, and linguistic uh, uh, groups uh, like Hazaras and Tajiks, Turkomans and Uzbeks, Ismailis, Balochis, Bravis, Nuristanis, Farsiwans, Kizilbash, and Amaks. So these groups are also part of Afghanistan, and we have to reckon with those also, and to see that uh, how we uh, deal with uh, these complexities. Uh, and of course, these ethnicities are overlaid by religious sects. So some of them are Sunnis and Shia and Ismailis, and they're also, of course, I think one of the key factors about Afghanistan uh, is how the ethnicities that remain in Afghanistan have cross-border affiliations. Uh, so Pashtuns have this affiliation with Pakistan. Tajiks, of course, look across the border to Tajikistan. Uh, Uzbeks and Turkomans doing likewise uh, with Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. And of course, Balochis straddling the border of Iran and Pakistan and also in Afghanistan. So there are very strong cultural influences uh, in, in uh, Afghanistan, and now we also have uh, influences from the adjacent areas of the Arabian subcontinent uh, since uh, 1979. Uh, so it's in this very complex environment, um, which is further aggravated by the geographical control of certain warlords in Afghanistan, uh, protection of minorities and women uh, is a very difficult challenge. Um, so go, responding to the question that was asked of me, um, the issue is that there are three transitions taking place in Afghanistan simultaneously at different speeds. The first is a security tra uh, transition, which is going from war, hopefully, to peace. Uh, the second is a political transition uh, which is uh, towards the formation of a legitimate and effective state. Uh, that transition uh, is still also happening. Uh, and of course, in terms of the rights of women and minorities, a socioeconomic transition uh, from a conflict economy to sustainable growth. And of course, these transformations do not happen in a vacuum, uh, but build upon existing societal arrangements uh, that condition and limit the range of available opportunities. Uh, so my prayer is, and uh, I say that I am aware uh, that there have been very courageous uh, but unknown heroes in Afghanistan who have struggled for rights of women and minorities, um, and we need to recognize them. I'm glad one of them, Ms. Kufi, is with us here today. Um, but what are, the, I have, uh, skipped upon many uh, issues, which I hope will come out if there is a question answer session. Uh, but personally, having been in government, I've learned two lessons. Um, the first, I told you, as was my first sentence here, uh, that Pakistan and Afghanistan are intertwined. So peace in Afghanistan means peace in Pakistan. That's the first lesson. The second is that Pakistan must help Afghanistan to the fullest extent that our resources allow us, particularly in the field of health. And finally, and I think this is the key uh, conclusion uh, which also partially answers the question that was put to me, is that Pakistan must respect the sovereignty and dignity of the Afghan people and the territorial integrity of Afghanistan, but also ensure that this is reciprocated. And this, uh, I think, is extremely important. It means that Pakistan does not interfere in Afghanistan. Pakistan respects, <laughs> and that's why I said, the sovereignty and dignity of the Afghan people. Pakistan does not interfere in the internal processes of Afghanistan. Yes, if called upon, we do, we should facilitate and assist wherever possible, uh, but 
I will conclude here. Um, I think there's a nice conclusion regarding Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, it comes out of a poem by Robert Frost. It said, and that's the key, good fences make good neighbors. That fence runs along the Duran line, and that's a big issue with Afghanistan. And we see an X here, Mr. Atchikzai, I get it. That's a, that's a big no on that one. So can I just ask you, Mr. Dustiger, how do, do these, will this fence make good friends or will it just create worse enemies? We uh, are, have been uh, pilloried and attacked consistently uh, by the Americans and NATO presence, the Afghan government, of these cross-border infiltrations. Um, and the way the only, the, yes, we uh, have to, we tried our best. We do try, I'm sure the current government is also trying its best to control our side of the border. Uh, but there is the fact uh, that the tehreek e taliban Pakistan, some of its leaders, moved to Afghanistan and they staged attacks from there. So when we asked that, yes, okay, we will take responsibility for our side of the border, will someone take responsibility for the other side of the border? And there, there was no taker. So, uh, you know, it was simply said to us that it was probably a capacity issue, it was very difficult, it is a thousands of kilometers long border. So a good border, is absolutely necessary as the f sort of one of the steps towards Pakistan and Afghanistan being good neighbors. And this is the reason in 2017, uh, we started putting up an actual fence, uh, many hundreds of kilometers of which have been put. So we need to regulate while keeping as open an environment uh, for the movement of people and goods. We have to have a delineated border which says here is Afghanistan and here is Pakistan. And if you move between them, you are moving between two sovereign countries. So that's why I say we respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Afghanistan, but at the same time we expect that it will also be respected of us all. The most peaceful region in the world perhaps is Europe, and there are no fences there between the countries. I think Mr. Achikzai brought his uh, people. And, this is, of course, and, quite the response again. And in fact, one of the happiest days in European history is when the Berlin Wall came down between the two Germanies. <laughs> and prior to the Soviet occupation, the relationships, state to state relations, were not that great. It was tense. And there were no fence, and there was no issue, no problem. There was free movement of people. Um, His Excellency, the minister himself mentioned, um, again, um, not only people from Khaybar um, Pukhtunkhwa or Quetta freely moving, but also from Lahore. Lots of people um, going for a weekend uh, just to see, um, to watch a, an Indian movie, and that's how things were. Um, so, uh, excusing the lack of offense um, for what happens either on this side or on that side um, is, 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 is uh, not a justifiable uh, reason. Uh, I think it's the policies that we need to question. Um, uh, and. And, and I fully agree that we need to be reciprocal in our policies. Uh, we certainly, on the Afghan soil, uh, need to give confidence um, and, 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 and belief uh, to, to the Pakistani state. Um, uh, it's, it's the state that, 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 that um, uh, sort of suspects um, the intention of Afghanistan. It's not the people, actually. Um, so we need to do that. But, but Pakistan also needs to, um, to give that to Afghanistan in a very practical manner um, in all that. You see fences are up, but violence is not down. Um, so it had nothing to do with violence. I think it has to do everything with mistrust. And of course, certain policies that we do believe have not changed, and therefore it comes back to that. 
isn't formalizing borders and registering immigrants a solution to the mistrust that, that exists? Because it's not only about putting a fence there, it's about registering information, it's about getting information. And as he said about uh, Europeans as well, so in all of Europe, there is a huge inflow of information which lacks between Afghanistan and Pakistan. I think there were more information about who is entering the country from which side and what their purpose is than I believe that that mistrust could be. Uh, 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 you could Sorry, overcome I'm, I'm that. I'm going to ask what's the question? My question is that uh, d uh, doesn't uh, having a fence there also implicate that there is a public policy? Uh, does uh, His Excellency Mr. Zakhilwal only believe that uh, a fence is just a fence, or does he believe that there is a public policy that accompanies it? I think we need to look into um, issues in order of importance. If, if our belief is that the trouble emanating from Pakistani soil um, towards us is not somewhere in the remote area. It is in plain cities, for example. It's somewhere in Karachi or somewhere in Quetta, far away um, from the uh, borderline. Um, uh, then that becomes a more pressing and important issue than the fencing. Because if we still believe that there is harboring or sort of support system present um, under the watchful eyes of the state in bigger cities, then how can we believe um, that the fencing is done with good intention? So it comes back to the intentions in the policy. So we need to respond that in that order and eventually come, of course, uh, to a place if there's still problem with crossing and all that. So how do, we, how do we respond to that? The bigger questions have not been answered. I think uh, the question, um, as Mr. Zakhilwal has raised, uh, is, has been asked from Pakistan uh, for more than a decade. But I think after Pakistan has conducted probably the largest anti-terrorist and counter-terrorism operation called zarb e uh, and whose second phase, Radul Fasad, is still going on, um, the Pakistan has done its best. Pakistan has done its best to cleanse Pakistani soil of these elements. Uh, yes, there might be some remnants there, but uh, it is our belief uh, that uh, after these two operations, there is no longer any organized presence of these elements in Pakistan. Um, but I, I will insist, until the territorial sovereignty issue is clearly delineated, we cannot begin to have uh, the kind of mutually respectful dialogue, a candid dialogue that is needed between Afghanistan and Pakistan, not just on matters of security, I think. Security has taken up, uh, practically overwhelmed uh, our relations, but there is so much else to talk about in terms of trade, in terms of uh, social advancement of our people, uh, particularly the people in border areas and on both sides are desperately poor. And to create uh, economic opportunities for them and to wean them off uh, from that illicit war economy I talked about. We have a question over here. I'll take a second one because Christine has got a question here. So uh, you, uh, oh, my uh, name is I, no, I'm gonna go with the woman. Stand up again, Christina. <laughs> Christine is going to ask a question, and then, and then, and then I'm going to, and then I'm going to let you. Sorry, man, woman. Why does it take more than three weeks to count two million votes? And are you concerned that this election, as previous elections, is going to be marred by allegations of fraud and contenders um, all claiming that they've actually won the election? Well, Christine, we are disappointed as much as you are. Uh, it shouldn't take that long. Um, particularly if there are only two million voters, uh, the result should have been known that day or the next day. It's unfortunate um, that in the past 18 years we haven't really resolved this. Um, uh, there certainly are um, uh, some disputes. Um, given the disputes in the nature of them, I'll be happier um, that um, that it takes longer and those disputes are responded to rather than to rush 
with the announcement of the result in this, this, this disputes are still outstanding. What were the guarantees uh, when you were negotiating with Taliban in the peace process or uh, when you will be in the future negotiating with the Taliban? Um, Kathy, thank you so much for the question. I will definitely um, uh, touch on that. But can I also go a little bit before uh, about the point that uh, the two ministers... Uh, uh, absolutely, were, absolutely. Just very briefly. Fazia, I think... Um, Let's agree, because you are majority of you representing the nation of Pakistan, right? And thank you so much for being here so late. I know it's, a, it's been a long day for all of us. Um, let's agree that the both nations of Afghanistan and Pakistan have been the victim of wrong politics of our politicians. The, the politicians have managed and um, implemented the policies towards each other countries by heart, by mind, not by heart. I often get this question uh, from uh, journalists, the two of whom I know, wonderful journalists here. As a woman, how do you manage all these challenges? And my answer is, the moment I start thinking that I'm a woman, I'm a leader, the, the problems increases. We have to be genuine and honest on what we do. I think we have not really been honest and genuine from both sides on the issue of border. We have really sensitized and politicized this issue. Um, and we have not given it a human face and a human touch. I think it's a time to give, uh, and it has, you know, we have a, a proverb in Farsi and Dari, uh, that some issues become like a milking, uh, a milking cow for some people. The issue of border has become a milking cow for some politicians in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. They have, it has been an issue that has been used and misused and I think some, somehow um, over-publicized. What I think is this, this issue has been poorly managed. We have to really find a different narrative to this issue. From Afghanistan side, I can at least tell you on behalf of myself, that there is a, a, a different narrative. We would like to get engaged with Pakistan. This was not the narrative that existed 10 years back. This was not the narrative that existed five years back. We would like to engage with Pakistan, with Pakistan people, with Pakistan establishment and the government on the pressing issues that have been regarded as source of conflict and look at it from a human perspective. You know how, how people who actually travel the two sides of the border daily base face enormous challenges, especially people with health problems. Uh, people who actually apply for visa. Visa has been one of the major issues. Probably you see some of these footages on social media of how the queues are long to obtain Pakistan visa for some of the people who have um, you know, uh, health problems. So let's, let's uh, give a different scenario to Afghanistan-Pakistan relationship. And from Afghanistan side, we are willing. We need some steps forward to change the narrative from Af Pakistan side. Now on the question, um, there is no guarantee. There is no guarantee. How can you expect uh, the Taliban to give guarantee that they will stick to their promises on women's rights? And that's why I believe there should be a guarantor for all the agreement of peace. Um, it could be an Islamic uh, organization, as mentioned before, OIC, EU, UN. There should be an, uh, a third party guarantee to ensure that whatever is promised, and there is no double face, whatever is promised in the negotiation table, that is respected all the way to the villages of Afghanistan. Thank you very much, Rosia, and thank you to all the panelists. They were all really very honest and open. Thank you very much. <laughs>